Hello, everyone. My name is Shireen Razak, and I'm the Penny Canner Endowed Chair in Women's Studies in the Department of Gender Studies at the University of California at Los Angeles. This webinar is entitled Palestine and Transnational Feminist Solidarity, Race, Gender and Genocide. It is brought to you from the Department of Gender Studies at UCLA. This is a time when feminists are actually being called upon to support a genocide in Gaza in the name of feminism. We're supposed to condemn without evidence mass rapes committed by Hamas and more important to ignore what is actually happening on the ground. The 30,000 dead, many of them children, mass starvation in real time. At the same time that the death toll rises before our very eyes, with children's faces, their emaciated faces, as they die on camera, this fills our screen. At this time, there is a vigorous campaign to suspend speech about the genocide, calling such speech anti-Semitic and punishing those who speak out. Indeed, just yesterday, one of our panelists, Professor Nadra Shalhub Kavorkian of the Hebrew University, was suspended for speaking out about the genocide. What is a transnational feminist analysis under these conditions? What are our politics? What does feminist solidarity look like? Why is the world seeing the genocide in real time and still not managing to stop it? These are our pressing feminist concerns today. Following our pre-recorded presentations, we will be happy to take questions and have a longer discussion. Also, I'd like to notify you that the longer versions of these presentations will be available on the YouTube channel of Gender Studies UCLA. Let me now introduce the panelists. First up, Professor Sarah Emoud is a Chicana feminist assistant professor of anthropology at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. Second, Professor Nadara Shalhu Kavorkian is a Palestinian feminist and the Lawrence Beal Chair in Law at the Faculty of Law and at the Institute of Criminology and the School of Social Work and Public Welfare at the Hebrew University. She is also the Global Chair in Law at Queen Mary University of London. She'll be followed by myself. Uh, and following that, Professor Zainab Korkman, who is an Associate Professor of Gender Studies at UCLA. And finally, Professor Minu Muallam, who is a Professor of Gender and Women's Studies and an affiliated faculty with several departments and centers at the University of California at Berkeley. We will now begin with the presentations and this will be followed uh, by going live and having a discussion among ourselves and with you. Hello, my name is Sada Ahmoud. I'm Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the College of the Holy Cross. And the piece that I'll be reading today is called Love in a Time of Genocide, a Palestinian Litany for Survival. What does it mean to practice feminism in a moment of bearing witness to genocide? I wrote this question in my notebook on the morning of Wednesday, October 18th, 2023, after reading through the daily counts of Israel's ongoing atrocities in Gaza. 4,200 Palestinians killed, including at least 1,000 children, and over 1 million displaced in just 10 days. As I stared in disbelief and thought of the people behind the numbers, I received a WhatsApp message from a young woman scholar in Gaza, Mona Amin, with whom I had first spoken several weeks before Israel commenced its genocide on Gaza. She had reached out to interview me for a research project on global Palestinian feminism. We scheduled a call and ended up speaking for an hour or so, she asking her questions in Arabic, me responding mostly in English with reflective pauses, bursts of laughter, a dropped call after the daily power outage in Gaza, a reconnection finally, and sharing stories in between. Our exchange that day was meaningful, as most connections are with Palestinians in Gaza. We did not stay in touch in the weeks after, each of us back to our busy lives, but I messaged Mona as soon as I heard that the war had begun on October 7th, a war that, in reality, 
began 75 years ago. Her first reply, quote, I am not fine at all. My neighbors and my colleagues are martyrs now. It's my turn now. Just pray for us. Day after day, as the death toll mounted, I worried about Mona and I continued to write to her. Mona was, like many Palestinians in Gaza at this very moment, suspended in the alternative space-time of colonial war, waiting for death, expecting it to arrive at any moment, while also fighting for her life. She had already lived through multiple Israeli assaults on Gaza, 2008, 2012, 2014, 2021, the timeline we all memorized and survived them. And she was also there when her younger brother's foot had to be amputated due to injuries he sustained from an Israeli airstrike in 2014. Originally from Beit Hanun, a city in the northeast of the Gaza Strip, Mona and her family fled their home after receiving a warning call from Israeli occupation forces to evacuate the area in the first days of the war. They knew their neighborhood would be bombarded next, and it was. Somehow, during all of this, Mona managed to text me that their home was destroyed in the bombing, rendered uninhabitable, and that they were forced to seek refuge in the Sheikh Radwan neighborhood of Gaza City. When I asked her if she had a message to women and feminists around the world in this moment, she replied, My message to all women and feminists is to just keep posting about Palestine and Palestinians, and to spread the truth, to spread the news as much as they can to keep talking about us. We are not numbers. Tell the world that we are not only under bombing as every time before, but that this time we are under a genocide. Tell the women and feminists that huge numbers of mothers lost their children and huge numbers of children will complete their lives without their mothers. Keep posting and posting and posting about us and keep us in your prayers. Today, as I read and reread her messages, over five weeks into the genocide, I am holding close to the memory of the kindness in Mona's voice when we spoke that day before all this began. Sorry. Sorry, this is just so hard to read sometimes. You know, she's still there. I am holding on to Mona's humility too. The humility of a young Palestinian woman living in the world's largest open air prison. When she asked about how I, trapped in all the privileges of bearing witness to colonial genocide from afar, in a US academic institution no less, understood feminism, about how I practiced it as a diasporic Palestinian. I am now especially humbled by one of her questions, quote, do you believe in the power of raising feminist awareness as a critical consciousness, end quote? She elaborated, what are its goals and how does it differ in your opinion from Western feminism? At this moment, it is Mona and our Palestinian women, our people in Gaza and across colonized Palestine who are teaching us lessons about what it means to practice feminism. I want to answer Mona's question with the proposition that practicing decolonial love in a time of genocidal war is a practice of critical feminist consciousness. In speaking about feminist consciousness, I am not speaking of that universal, atemporal feminism that casts Palestinian women as defenseless victims who must be saved from the savage brutality of our indigenous men, especially our Muslim men that dangerous orientalist trope that has been weaponized to sell imperial war to the masses, justifying the invasion, theft, and destruction of our homelands. Nor is it that brand of colonial feminism that views us as nothing more than human animals, as they referred to us on October 9th while they rained bombs on our people, who birth future terrorists, those 4,506 and counting Palestinian children, our colonizers and their backers have massacred in less than four weeks, stripping them of their humanity, denying them their childhood and future. In fact, 
It is these narratives that have stoked fear and contempt in our colonizers this time around, mobilizing them for a genocidal assault against our people, the grotesque scale of which we could not have fathomed. Indeed, while our colonizer bombards our buildings, homes, hospitals, and places of worship on such an immense scale, leaving our dead babies to be pulled from underneath the rubble alongside the bodies of thousands more that remain buried, it dehumanizes the entire Palestinian population of Gaza, rendering them an enemy that must be killed in order to give life to the colony. No, I am speaking of a decolonial Palestinian feminism. To practice feminism in the midst of bearing witness to genocide is to embrace love as a radical consciousness, as a radical decolonial politic of fighting for life. To practice feminism in this moment is to hold each other through the vast darkness of our grief, to walk with each other hand in hand, to bear witness to landscapes of death, and, as Mona urges us, to tell the truth. Indeed, Mona's words invite us to break out of this rasa, this lump in our throats that keeps us from speaking, and to speak loudly and courageously into the wind. Telling the truth means not only refusing to look away from that which feels unbearable to watch, let alone know, that our people are suffering from thirst and hunger under unceasing bombardment with nowhere safe to seek refuge. As Mona wrote, quote, if we don't get martyred from bombing, we will die from the lack of water and food, end quote. Telling the truth as feminists in this moment requires rejecting colonial narratives. It requires boldly affirming the power and creativity of our life force that we have always possessed and cultivated as indigenous women. The power we have always wielded in service of dismantling settler colonialism and genocidal war, thrusting its overbearingness into crisis. In the same breath, telling the truth means amplifying our visions for freedom and dignity. If we listen, we can witness the fractals of these visions in the voices of our people in Gaza, like Mona, who said, I survived many wars, but this one, I don't think I will survive. I don't want to die. I have dreams. I want to have the chance to travel, and I want to have a chance to do my master's degree and then my PhD. I have many dreams. I am still young. Tell the world, tell the world that I am here, one among many. All the people here are traumatized and don't know how to express it, but we will not forget. Please keep talking about us, keep telling our stories and spreading what is happening now and keep us in your prayers. Mona's message, her affirmation that she is still here despite many wars, that she has dreams, and that she and we will not forget is an affirmation of Palestinian life and future making in the midst of colonial attempts at epistemicide and memoricide on top of genocide. I responded to Mona that we will never forgive the world that has allowed this to happen, nor will we stop fighting for our people's lives. I told her that I would share her words and that we love her and we love our people. To love our people and our homeland are one and the same. That love is something the colonizer can never comprehend and can never take away from us. To know this, to feel this love deeply, is to know that we have already won. This is uh, Nadira Shalhoub Kevorkian. And I am speaking to you from the old city of Jerusalem. I'm a professor of uh, criminology and social work, uh, both at uh, Queen Mary University of London and at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And my talk is entitled Ashla, that is Ba and it's body bags, body parts, body remnants, and the culmination of the genocide in Gaza. So I will be really talking about something that I have written about before, which is criminalities in spaces of death. But this time I'm speaking 
during the ongoing genocide in Gaza with the loaded evidence of body bags, of body parts, of wounded flesh, wounded children, where there are so many questions that are posed, where the political place given to brutal state killing and the colonized wounded flesh, what is called Ashla in Arabic, is my point of departure. I'm really wondering and asking what is the political work of the brutalization of the scattered, of the cut to pieces, body parts, of a newborn decomposed dead flesh, of bodies of my beloved ones. So I am staging Ashla. In Arabic, Ashla is the scattered body parts, is the wounded pieces of flesh to shed the light on the relations of force and the racial hierarchies in this context, in the settler colony, that are really imbricated in biopolitical and necropolitical domains of the racial command over the dismantled and torn flesh of the Palestinian. And I want to argue that Ashla, the, the scattered body parts, the wounded, the dispersed flesh, reveal the insatiability appetite of the colonizer to make it impossible for the Palestinian to even be, to be in the flesh, to be as a whole, and to rise above the wounded organ, the torn pieces of the flesh. So this is where I'm starting. And the reason why I chose to speak about Ashla is a kid, his name is Abdullah. And Abdullah uh, Abu Sultan from Gaza is a 15 year old kid who decided to, who I'm, I met when learning that he decided to write a book. He used to write books before he had a teacher who taught him how to write novels. But during this war, uh, the genocidal war on Gaza, Abdullah's teacher was torn turned into Ashla, he was uh, hit by a rocket and he and he was um, he became body bags, body parts. And Abdullah decided to dedicate his next novel to grief, but to really memorialize the love and to honor his teacher. This is my point of departure. My point of departure is the ashla, the body parts, the body bags, the, the flesh, but the scattered flesh in Gaza, in Gaza today. And I'm inviting you to read with me the violence inscribed on the body, the violence inscribed on the dismembered dead body, on the shattered flesh, on ashla. And therefore, I want us first to look and to try to think of Ashla from an ontological, ontological inquiry and to think ontologically into the centrality of the dead and the dispersed, the Ashla, to examine the matter of the body and the body flesh, yeah, and namely the dead and the ruined flesh to provide an understanding of the politics of wounding, of the politics of torturing, of the politics of culminated unchilding, as the politics of en enlivening, uh, as, as Abdullah have done. So, so if I start from there, and I'm, I think through the writing and through the discussions that were raised by many uh, scholars, I see that you know, not only ont ontologically, um, I, I feel that uh, Palestinians are perceived, yeah, as non-human. We've seen it in the uh, discussions and statements of politicians where Palestinians were called human animals, where Netanyahu and his, his you know, ministers have really allowed, opened up, the possibilities to dismember 
to to turn Palestinians into Ashla, to turn Gaza to to totally flatten Gaza. So the Ashla, the dismembered Ashla, is is and that demand is a demand of scattering and of of dismembering Palestinians. Now, ontological reading of the wounded and the scattered, lifeless flesh is intensified during war times, and we see it today in Gaza, to further secure the idea of race when the scattered, lifeless body and racial being is read via the incomprehensibility of being human. So Ashla is something that does not live. So this becomes a primary measure of being human and the principal side for maintaining and extending the Palestinian unwholeness. So the moment you hit a body and you turn it into scattered body parts, you, there is no life and no humanity there. And the question is how racialized violence are embodied via Ashla? Is it a symptom of a bio-ontological uh, and onto racial reading that develops the power order of racial categorization, activating a carceral culture of dispersal of ashla and uprooting. So I think that by unpacking the genocidal moment today in Gaza, the destruction embedded in the securitization because the whole attack over the the body the body politics and the actual body and flesh of the palestinian is done by two theologies as i have said in my previous work it's the security theology and it's the sacralized theology yeah and sacralization when they claim that god gave them the land and they have the power to do whatever they want so the settler colonial logic and actions of elimination and the ontological non-humanity of palestinians was really evident in various public statements by zionist leaders we see it in netanyahu's for example a statement when he said, well, you must, and um, you must remember Amalek, what Amalek has done to you. And this is from the Holy Bible or Knesset um, Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee member Boaz uh, Bismuk, who is a Likud um, party, said that, and I quote here, we must not forget that the cruel and monstrous innocent civilians so he's saying that all Gazans are not innocent civilians from Gaza, had an active role in the pogrom inside Israel, and it's forbidden to show mercy to the cruel. There is no place for any humanitarian gestures. The memory of Amalek must be wiped out. So again, wiping out, flattening Gaza, or the fact that they're talking about uh, starving them and we've seen two days ago how there's a massacre called the, the flower massacre where people were running towards getting a uh, flower to feed their kids and they ended up in in dying over 100 were were killed and 750 were injured so that call to destroy palestinians to starve them to death to throw a nuclear bomb and turn them into ashla is what made me center death, center the overkillability, and center Abdullah's insight on on ashla as part of the matrix of my analysis and the coloniality of non-being for Palestinians. So Abdullah is telling us that the coloniality of being in an anti-Palestinian world is about being a shla, is about being body parts. And he writes, he speaks, he's acting against framing Palestinians as lacking any ontological weight, as his eyes, his acts and words are, are telling us otherwise. So Abdullah's future novel, Ashla, uh, as he explained, reveals the global political necroeconomy pertaining to the colonized um, person. And that global political economy that is producing the Palestinian as non-being.
not even nothingness, not even a shla, never to become a whole, never to become an entity, a nation, a collective, and that the that the unchilded in Gaza are something else, are the richard of the earth. Uh, they are ontologically different, those Palestinian kids, Palestinian people, maybe even sub-ontologically different, yeah? So, so here I'm centering Ashla as a difference, as ontologically non-existing, which is a difference between being and what lies below being, what is marked as dispensable, as non-grievable, as disposable, as scattered, yeah? So even if I use Fanon to think about the, the flesh, or I use a black scholar such as Hortonez Piller, where she talks about the importance of theorizing from the flesh, I go back to looking at the notion of, of perceiving the scattered body parts, the ashla, as sub-ontological difference, as non-existing, yeah? So here, you know, that sub-ontological non-existence as a human, I argue, as ashla, indexes patterned colonial politics that refuse to accept the, the wholeness of the, of the Palestinian. So number one, I want us to remember that what Abdullah is teaching us is, is he is teaching us about the ontological non-being of the scattered body, not even the whole body, not even the flesh, but rather the scattered diffused body. I'm taking it to another space where, where uh, Abdullah and where others are trying to take me. So Samar is seven years old and she was captured by her, her father sitting in her bed talking to her cat, yeah? And she was talking to her cat and explaining to her that I want you to remember and she's holding as a cat and telling her, listen, if I will die, you need to promise me, you really need to promise me not to eat my ashla. I think that Samar is teaching us, number one, that it seems that the only person that can listen to Samar, that can listen to the Palestinian voice is the little cat. It seems that the world is not listening to the dispersal, to the ongoing Nakba, to the scattered body parts of the Palestinian. But some are like Abdullah, like the father, like, like the different, the, the Palestinians in Gaza are finding, are innovating new modes of dealing, of refusing, of refusing to be non-being. So Samar is talking to her cat because the world failed to listen to her. And Abdullah is writing his novel, and he is really gathering and reassembling the ashla of his teacher to tell everybody, I refuse to accept the dismemberment of the Palestinian and the uprooting. And Tamar is saying, even if I die, please maintain my wholeness, please maintain my my voice, please maintain my power. The second point I want to talk about is, as I have said, my analysis builds on, on the writings of black feminists, on the writings of anti-colonial reflections that looks at the materialization and dematerialization of the flesh, that matter of racial being as being a primary major of being human, like I'm thinking about Jackson's book, or I'm thinking about Horton S. Piller. But what I'm suggesting is that reading the Ashla, the Palestinian flesh, scattered, dead, wounded, bloody flesh goes beyond the conceptual border of modernist representationalism that engineers the racial body. Ontologizing that scattered flesh 
and its gendered analysis in understanding Abdullah's words, Abdullah's acts, Abdullah's affect, stubbornly reveal his refusal yeah, to accept the colonizer's criminal dispersing of the Palestinian Ashla and its message that Palestinians are at the limits of the wholeness of the human. This ontologizing distinctions are inextricable and are being different or different than nature, yeah, are, are central. The affectivity of racialty is also very important here. The materiality of the Palestinian embodied scattered flesh is where I want us to think and to wonder why what is the political work of this scattered body? What is it doing to the settler colony? Why is it that to speak against uh, uh, against the Palestinian wholeness is is important? And how can we think it? Another point of the of of importance to me is looking at Ashla and suggesting that. Uh, Ashla not only is my ontological, racial, and ethical feminist point of departure, but it's it's a space, it's a live, it's it's where the battle is. It's in that flesh in the Ashla, and this is my way of understanding the ontoraciality of what goes on uh, today. Because what I read from the amount of killing, from the fact that even graveyards, the the attack, over sixteen graveyards were smashed, uh, uh, over thirty thousand people were killed, babies are left in incubators to decompose, parents cannot find their kids, and they're writing the names over the flesh. Maybe, maybe they can collect it. These are all uh, spaces of reading, of connecting the colonizer's violence against the flesh, against the Palestinian wholeness, against Palestinian fatherhood, kinship, childhood, family, connectivity, to land, to life. It's there to say, and this is what I read from what is happening today, that your fleshy existence does not exist, and hence, you cannot be, you cannot exist. Hi, this is Zainab Korkman, Associate Professor of Gender Studies at UCLA. And the title of my talk today is The Cunning of Pseudo-Progressive Discourses, Anti-Muslim Racism, Anti-Semitism, and Transnational Feminist Solidarity. As we speak today, our world is being shattered by colonialism, racism, and war most acutely in the case of ongoing genocidal violence in Palestine. And in this context, critiques of anti-Muslim racism and anti-Semitism are getting co-opted by power holders. How should we respond? What do feminists do when anti-racist discourses in all their gender dimensions get weaponized, get fashioned to fit political agendas that are antithetical to liberation, justice, and peace? Today I speak about the politically reactionary uses of critiques of anti-Muslim racism and anti-Semitism in the context of colonial and national projects of rule spanning Turkey, Palestine, Israel, and the US. And I speak from a specific positionality. I speak as a scholar and citizen of Turkey. I speak as a scholar who's located in and who has recently become a citizen of US. And I speak as a social justice oriented scholar from a Muslim Middle Eastern background, standing in solidarity with Palestine and against anti Muslim racism and anti Semitism. And last but not the least, I speak as a feminist. And I emphasize how those reactionary forces that seek to censor and criminalize progressive critiques by falsely accusing them of being anti Muslim or anti Semitic are often the very same ones that seek to censor and criminalize feminist and LGBTIQ voices. This doesn't only reveal the hypocrisy of their pseudo-progressive wielding of anti-racist discourses, it also reminds us that racialized state violence and heteropatriarchal violence are co-constitutive. They depend upon each other. 
and retrieving our anti-racist discourses from reactionary mobilization is crucial to transform transnational feminist scholars and activists. Today, I am talking as the genocidal violence in Palestine intensifies with full U.S. support. And I'm talking as the Turkish president holds pro-Palestinian rallies, welcomes pro-Palestinian persecuted academics in Turkish universities, and strategically aligns himself with a globally oppressed Muslimness and against anti-Muslim racism, garnering the appreciation of international progressive audiences. These important but instrumental gestures happen, however, precisely while the president mobilizes Turkish state forces for colonialist violence against racialized groups such as Kurds. Indeed, the president's pro-Palestinian posturing has served to divert attention from Turkey's strategy of military violence in Kurdish areas in Turkey, Iraq, and Syria, or from its support for the genocidal violence in Artsakh. Moreover, the government's pseudo-anti-colonialist rhetoric on behalf of Palestine unabashedly draws upon neo-imperialist, and in this case neo-Ottomanist, visions of the Turkish hegemony in the region. Turkish government's gesturing as against anti-Muslim racism further embeds a framework for terrorizing dissident citizens and academics of Turkey as anti-Muslim betrayers of the nation. For example, Turkey had been busy with the mass criminalization of over 1,000 academics who had petitioned against military violence in Kurdish regions. They were then targeted as anti-Muslim, anti-Turkish betrayers, and these academics were criminally persecuted with the accusations of propagandizing in support of a terrorist organization. Such attacks were accompanied by the dismantling of proto-ethnic studies programs where minority languages like Kurdish were taught in Turkey. Not coincidentally, this came hand in hand with attacks on feminist and LGBTIQ social movements and with attacks on gender studies in the country. The government has been busy discursively pushing feminist and queer activists outside of the nation by deeming them betrayers of religion and nation, and by criminalizing them, sometimes literally as terrorists. And this was accompanied by the defunding and the institutionalization of the nascent field of gender studies. The Turkish state's weaponization of anti-Muslim racism and its feminist repercussions mirrors the American state's use of anti-Semitism, a project that uses anti-Semitism to justify supporting Israeli state violence. In declaring critiques of Israel all anti-Semitism, the U.S. moves to silence academic and social movement critiques. In this context, the pseudo-progressive appeal of fighting anti-Semitism moves out of the frame the long-standing and ongoing colonialist violence against racialized Muslims of Palestine and beyond. And this is a violence in which the U.S. and Israel have long been allies, of course. It also faces the long-standing and ongoing doxing, harassment, and ousting of faculty and students by Zionist groups and by university administrations moved by them. Such brazen misuse of anti-Semitism is part and parcel of the broader attacks against critical race, feminist, and LGBTIQ initiatives, and even against diversity as such now. The effect is to further enshrine an American brand of whiteness, which continues to be deeply and violently misogynist, anti-LGBTIQ, anti-Muslim, and if ironically, anti-Semitic. So across these contexts, the weaponization of pseudo-anti-racist rhetoric by power holders have been the discursive track through which violence against racialized populations get legitimized and dissent gets silenced. In other words, there is nothing essentially a historically progressive about wielding a critique of anti-Muslim racism or anti-Semitism for that matter. These critics might and do become appendices to violence and domination. This does not diminish the need to vigorously analyze and energetically organize against anti-Muslim racism and anti-Semitism. Rather, this means that the mere invocation of an anti-racist stance cannot unconditionally serve as a marker of legitimacy. As transnational feminists, our analysis are central to understanding the mistranslations and reactionary appropriations of our critical discourses and central to navigating these fraught terrains.
We cannot assume that anti-racist or feminist discourses will travel and translate accurately and uniformly through their travels in space and time. Nor can we afford to vacate them. We are here to defend feminist and ethnic studies, which are under immediate peril in this time of re-energized attacks on academia. We are here to reclaim anti-racist and feminist discourses in this time of their misappropriation as appendices to colonialist and imperialist violence. And we recommit to understanding the many transnationally informed localized struggles we find ourselves in. We recommit to tracking the mistranslations of our progressive discourses. And we recommit to forging lines of communication and connection towards transnational feminist solidarities. My name is Shireen Razak, and I'm the Penny Canner Endowed Chair in Women's Studies in the Department of Gender Studies, and I'm also the Chair of Gender Studies. In early February of 2024, the French Minister for Gender Equality announced that she would withdraw funding from feminist groups who did not hold the same analysis of what happened on October 7th during the Hamas attacks in Israel. Principally, she said, if feminists did not agree that thousands and thousands of women were raped and killed, and if they did not condemn Hamas, they would lose funding. Feminist groups repeated over and over again that they condemned all violence and that they condemned all violence against women in particular. But they wanted to consider what was the evidence for mass rapes committed by Hamas on October 7th. Even when the extent and description of the violence that the French minister advanced was proven to be false, thousands and thousands of women were not brutally killed and mass raped, feminist groups were still condemned and were told they would be denied funding. And all of this would occur through policy and law. So the targeting of feminist groups for censure and the accusation that they failed to care about Israeli women and failed to care about violence against Israeli women really turns on a very specific notion of gender and a very specific notion of gender violence. Consequently, it also turns on a very specific notion of feminist politics. So simply put, the sexual violation of Israeli women about which feminists are presumed to care the most counts more than any other violence, such as violence done to Palestinian women or to Palestinian people. A very obvious immediate distinction here is that there is a racial line operating through this idea of gender violence. On one side of the equation, you have one group of women, Israelis, who are always understood to be Jewish and white or of European origin. That is how they are understood popularly, in contradistinction to Palestinian women who are always understood to be not white and Muslim. And this is regardless of what the actual reality is. And so this racial line operates between the two groups, that you have one group that's white and liberal and modern and committed to gender equality, and you have another group belonging to non-white people who are pre-modern, who are not advanced enough, and who are not committed to gender equality. So this racial line is pretty obvious. The analytical foundation that supports this racial hierarchy is the idea that feminists should care the most about sexual violence, leaving other forms of violence for other people to think about. So when feminists are scripted as social actors who should care only about sexual violence, we're actually consigned to a field where the women we care about, women who are sexually violated, are stripped of any other part of their history. So what emerges is a kind of formula, it's a single axis explanation that leaves other parts of women's lives completely in shadow. The understanding that gender is principally about women who are at risk of sexual violence or who are targeted for sexual violence 
This introduces the idea of a universal woman. If this is who all women are, and this is how you define who all women are, then women who don't have this part of their biography as the only part of their biography that matters are necessarily not as much women or not even women at all. The end result is that some women disappear as women, leaving in place a type of woman who is the only legitimate subject of feminism. The end result is that only some women can inhabit that space we call gender legitimately, and everyone else is booted out of it. You know, this is very similar to an argument that we get uh, in Black Studies and, and famously by Horton Spillers, who argue that Black women are ungendered. That is to say their own sexual violation, their reproductive lives, mark them not as women, but as property. So they are booted out, they are ungendered. Evictions from gender occurs very differently for each group of women. Black women are booted out because they are not women, they're property. But Palestinian women are booted out because they don't come into the screen as women. They come into the screen as Hamas. Race in this scenario gives content to the story of sexual violation as the single axis of oppression in women's lives. One important aspect of this is that Israeli women's sexual violation enters our visual field and we're able to see it through race. That is, we're able to see it through understanding that what Israeli women have suffered is the barbarism of Palestinian men, of Hamas. Relatedly, Palestinian women can't enter our visual field as targets of sexual violence unless we understand that as targets of sexual violence, they're really targeted by their own men. So we can see the sexual violence if it comes from their own men. We cannot imagine, for example, that Palestinian women might be targeted by the Israeli Defense Forces or Israeli soldiers. So their sexual violence and consequently their standing as victims doesn't really come into the picture unless we consider the racial aspect of the explanation. So what I most like to say, it echoes a phrase from the historian George Mossy, that race hitches a ride on gender. And this results in the expulsion of Palestinian women from the category women and most importantly, from the category of law. So one way to understand the landmines that feminists have to navigate as they cross this political field is to understand how race and gender are co-constituted here. And what I mean by co-constitution is how does race make gender? How does gender make race? How does one category actually get its content from another. Sometimes this sounds like an impossibly kind of abstract relation, and I really want to uh, consider how these two things, race and gender, are operating in this understanding of what feminists should care about and which kind of violence matters the most. The first and the most important, maybe the most obvious thing to say about the call for feminists to acknowledge Israeli suffering and deny Palestinian suffering is that as racial discourse, this mode of communication actually proceeds by what many scholars call tabloid realism. And this is very simple. Communications really proceed by way of the kinds of headlines that you would see in a publication like the National Enquirer. That is to say, the discursive field is littered with beheaded babies, mass rapes. The visual field is populated with blood on the pants of Israeli women who were killed. You have images of women with their legs splayed and their underwear showing. These images generate what I would like to say is racial affect. That is to say they provoke and they consolidate emotions 
that travel from body to body until it forms a kind of sediment or a, a layer in which there's a, a, a strong jolt, an affective charge in the collective unconscious that reasserts the idea of the racially superior subject as opposed to the inferior culture. As I've shown in my book, Nothing Has to Make Sense, Upholding White Supremacy Through Anti-Muslim Racism, these kinds of powerful emotions and the, the affect or the layer that they form, you see them traveling through law. So for example, if you want to ban any mention of Islam in the curriculum, or if you want to ban Muslim clothing, or if you want to approve the torture and surveillance of Muslims, or if you want to legally authorize bombings, you actually need this powerful racial affect because with it, all those things that you want to do begin to seem reasonable. And it's important that I say here that they begin to seem reasonable and not logical. So you can have the conviction that Muslim men or all Muslims carry a gene for violence. That is not actually logical or supported, but it begins to seem reasonable when these images of barbaric Muslim men flash across your mind. So nothing has to make sense as uh, uh, you know, the title of the book is, is really about you don't need the logic. You just need the strong emotions and the racial affect, and that will provide the sense. For example, this is the Lemkin Institute for Genocide Prevention. And they issued a report on the extent of sexualized violence that we see on October 7th. And the report, as I've said, it really strives for objectivity. It doesn't shy away from what feminists like Elia call the weaponizing of rape. In fact, it struggles quite valiantly with two things. One is the overwhelming evidence that there is no evidence of mass rape. And simultaneously, it struggles with the astonishing lies and propaganda by the Israeli state and its supporters. So given these two things, the Lemkin report nevertheless concludes, given the evidence of sexualized violence on October 7th, the Lemkin Institute believes that sexualized violence took place and was widespread. So it reaches that conclusion in spite of its earlier premises that there is no evidence and there was massive propaganda. Ironically, of course, you know, the Israeli demonstrations that you've seen with women carrying placards saying, we believe women, you cannot possibly imagine an equivalent placard, we believe Palestinians, when they tell us 30,000 people have been killed. Palestinians and Palestinian women cannot emerge in the visual field. So now feminist groups who want to ask some questions about this are accused of being anti-Semitic. And we cannot, as feminists, easily refute this charge by stating the opposite of what is a fundamental feminist tenet, which is that women are targeted, sexually targeted, during militarization and war. We know this. So the Lemkin Institute does actually bring in the factor of Israeli propaganda, but that doesn't interrupt or interfere with the final conclusion. What is left out of the frame? We should acknowledge that we are between a rock and a hard place, in the imaginary of a universal woman, because we do know for certain that women are violated in war, and we do believe women. But what is left out of the frame? Dispossession, bombs, the cutting off of food and water and fuel, of course, the histories of the cutting off of food, water and fuel, the extensive history of Gaza as an outdoor prison, all of this is out of the frame. And it's out of the frame because these things do not happen to women per se. And because they do not happen to women per se, they cannot be a feminist issue. So when the Palestine Feminist Collective insists that Palestine is a feminist issue and brings up these matters, it doesn't easily win the argument 
because of the racial affect that is in place. Race, the race of Palestinian women, drowns out any narrative of sexual violation. And instead, the genocidal violence that is directed at the people of Gaza is easily translated into a legitimate violence that we must do to root out Hamas, as the Israeli military keeps saying. So Gaza has no real people. It only has Hamas. It has no real women either because we don't see any evidence of their sexual violation. And that is all that we understand to be connected to gender and to a woman. Gender is how you make the case for civilizational superiority and to the entitlement to the land that comes with it. Race is never just race. It's always gender, sexuality, and class operating through each other. The systems come into operation through each other and they give content to each other. This is an effect that we often try to squeeze into the concept of intersectionality. When we use this concept too often, we understand it as a kind of diversity. One system is piling up on another, so you have gender and race piles up on it and sexuality piles up on it and class piles up on it. And that kind of mathematical piling up sometimes blocks our understanding of how one system becomes the other system. Solidarity really requires that we navigate this very complex geopolitical field attentive to the co-constitution of systems of oppression, rather than understand how the systems are discrete and merely complicate each other. Methodologically, a place to start is to think about how one system is the language of another system. How that is that a specific notion of gender gives content to racial hierarchies and how racial hierarchies require a gendered cast of characters. It requires brutal, misogynist, racialized men. It requires invisible, racialized women. We don't think about them too much. And it requires white women who suffer and who suffer more than any other women. Hi, my name is uh, Minu Mualem. I am a professor of gender and women's studies at UC Berkeley. And the title of my uh, talk is Liberation Through Occupation, Interrogating the Selective Plot of Feminist Solidarity. Women's History Month has fallen precisely five months into a US-funded Israeli genocide of Palestinian in Gaza. A reference to imperialist feminism that is complicit with the genocide, supporting the racist logic of dividing the world between those on the side of light, democracy and civilization, versus those who are on the side of darkness and barbarism, especially Muslims who are repressing women and penetrating the civilized world to destroy it, is once again at the center of justification of war, settler occupation, and mass killing of Palestinians. As a feminist scholar who has been critical of the simple binary of men versus women, to tell a feminist story that all women are victimized regardless of their biopolitical and geopolitical differences, and are sisters in victimization regardless of four decades of anti-racist, intersectional, and transnational feminist studies, I feel the urgent need to question such notions of solidarity between the victims and the victimizers in the racist imperialist narratives crucial to understand not only how particular reference to feminism and women's rights have become complicit with the genocide, but also its collaborator justifying the mass murder of more than 12,000 children, masses of women and men, old and young, including 50,000 of pregnant women, hundreds of birthing women having C-sections with no anesthesia, the public torture and humiliation of Palestinian men, and the bombardment of schools, hospitals, mosques, churches, including 
the killing of numerous journalists and the intentional starvation of Ghazan, leaving thousands of people disabled or impossible to live with disability under constant bombardment. In this short presentation, I do not wish to talk about women's movements in Iran or Iranian feminists who have been supporting Palestinian women condemning genocide in Gaza. I'm also not talking about the Islamic Republic of Iran and its patriarchal rules and regulation or its repressive policies. What I want to talk about in this few minutes is the global staging of the dual moral framework on some Iranian women's rights activists who claim to be the voice of Iranian women and in solidarity with women in Iran while supporting the Israeli state genocide in Gaza. On November 12, 2023, almost a month after the Israeli genocide of masses of women, children, and men, in Paris, Los Angeles, and Brussels, some segments of the Iranian diaspora raised the flag of the ancient ancien regime in Iran, the Pahlavi dictatorship, along with the Israeli flag, while chanting solidarity and Israel's national anthem. Later on, on December 21st, 2023, at the peak of the continuous brutal bombardment of the Ghazian people by the Israeli army, a mural was erected as part of 18 murals by an Iranian-American called Uman Khalili in Jerusalem, depicting two female figures, an Israeli woman soldier of Iranian descent who was killed on October 7th, and Mahsa Amini, who died under the custody of the Iranian moral police in September 2022. The staging of Iranian Mahsa Amini, an Israeli soldier, Shirel Hayyem Pur, standing side by side, wrapped by the call to action by the Israeli apartheid regime as Esthers of the World Rise, reveals the long-time alliance of some of the Iranian oppositional groups, including monarchies, the terrorist organization of MEK, and many so-called women's rights activists in diaspora. I find it urgent to in question to interrogate the politics of such colonial feminism that defends the sanctity of the lives of some women at the expense of the destruction of others through necropower in Ashil members' terms, or politics as the work of death, as the right to kill some while investing in the life of others in a global stage or what Shirin Rasser calls gender disposability. The dangers of, the dangers of a universalized worldview feminism and its neoliberal weaponization and its refusal to neither dissenter nor acknowledge it, its role in what we witness as the racism of extermination is yet another facet of the imperialist and Zionist feminist saviors and their twisted logic of saving some women at the expense of mass killing of the others. These two logics have been closely working with each other to justify war and military occupation in the Middle East, especially in the last few decades. The juxtaposition of these two events as a site of solidarity between Israeli Zionist women and Iranian women at the time of genocide reveals openly and blatantly the dual moral framework of settler colonialism and imperialist feminism and their continuous effort to justify women's liberation through colonial occupation. Of course, this is not the first time women's issues have been weaponized and used to justify war, militarism, and the destruction of the colonized. Women's question has been part and parcel of colonial modernity. More recently, a reference to the homogeneous category of women and the binary opposition of the world between the civilized and the barbaric has justified the last few decades of war and occupation in the Middle East, from Iraq to Afghanistan and Palestine.
Yet a shameless reference to feminist solidarity and its global staging within a dualist moral framework has never reached such visually disturbing exposing blatant racism of extermination vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians. While sadly, social media has facilitated the fabrication of lies with bombs, it has also created an opportunity for all of us not living in Gaza to witness the horrific images of dead bodies of masses of women, starving children, brutalized men, and the destruction of the whole landscape. I want to focus in the next few minutes on some of the Iranian women's right activist complicity, if not alliance and collaboration with the colonial project of liberation through occupation and their vocal or silent complicity with the Israeli genocide and the Euro-American supporters. Of course, this phenomenon is not limited to some Iranian women's rights activists, but a whole contingency of Euro-American feminists who have been silent in the last five months of this brutal genocide, if not spoken directly or indirectly in support of the U.S. imperialism and the Israeli apartheid state. Let me focus on three groups of Iranians that have either stood with the genocide or become complicit in their silence. The first group of the Iranian diasporic who have been standing with the Israeli genocide are the Iranian monarchists. Let's not forget that from the beginning of the Iranian revolution of 1979, those groups have collaborated with the US and Israel to overthrow the Islamic Republic pushed for harsh sanctions against Iran and consistently advocated the military occupation of Iran from the failed coup, coup d'etat of Nojeh to the Iraqi occupation of Iran to terrorism of MEK organization to the state terrorism of Israelis in Iran, Israeli state in Iran. Islamophobia, Arianism, and racism have been core components of these groups' ideologies. Indeed, various media platforms from BBC Farsi and Voice of America to Saudi and Israeli TV channels from Iran International to Manoto, which has been closed since January 2024, have been working hard to fabricate a nostalgic idea of the Pahlavi dictatorship era as the good old days of alliance between Israel, Iran, and the US. In a video uploaded on the internet, an Iranian woman contesting the headscarf confronts the veil woman in Tehran and shouts, I'm not like you. I'm an alien. Indeed, such examples leave us puzzled about the convergence of racism, anti-Semitism, Zionism, and Islamophobia. The second group is what I call the native informants, or those feminists or women's rights activists who, since their displacement from Iran, have been collaborating either with the liberal or right-wing think tanks and media platforms in the US, Europe, and Israel, in their support of imperialist agenda of the Euro-American and their regional allies in their continuation of imperial and neo-colonial intervention in the region. As feminists, these women's rights activists or native informants in Spivak's terms have connected or internalized their perception of Iran from the point of view of imperialism, Zionism, and Islamophobia claiming that this is a battle between democracy and what they call Islamism. Many of these so-called diasporic activists in the US, Israel, and European countries have been pressuring the US to increase its deadly sanctions against the Iranian people, to intervene militarily in Iran, and to liberate Iranian women through war and occupation. These groups have been writing their communities of history and culture back to the temporality of the empire and its regimes of knowledge production. For example, on December 11, 2023, two months after the brutal genocide in Gaza, a so-called women's and human rights activist called Lili Mo who has been calling for a feminist revolution in Iran, gave a passionate speech in a pro-Israeli vigil in London 
and declared that, in quote, now we are witnessing here people talking about genocide, ethnic cleansing, about hate on humanities. Where is their humanity when they say from the river to the sea? They're chanting for genocide. The people of Iran is on your side, meaning Israel, on my side and the side of humanities, end of uh, quote. On November 18, 2023, another Iranian native informant, a self-affirming women's rights activist and a darling of both liberal and right-wing and Zionist media, Masih Ali Nejad, called for an Israeli attack on Iran, emphasizing the urgency of international unity to prevent further victimization of Israelis. The collaboration of this so-called women's rights activist with some of the most misogynistic and racist right-wing political leaders, such as Donald Trump and Pompeo in the U.S. and Israel, in their Palestinian woman washing, is another example. The third group and the group I am the most concerned with are those Iranian women's rights activists who have remained silenced vis-a-vis -vis this genocide, pretending that nothing is happening on the global stage, on the one hand, and on the other hand, launching in the past few weeks a campaign against the so-called Iranian gender apartheid regime. The dual moral framework of these women's rights activists expressing so much concern by putting on the map the human rights of Mahsa Amini during the Women Life Freedom Uprising and their silence and complicity with the genocide of masses of Palestinian women shows the appeal of the colonial imperialist feminism after more than four decades of anti-racist, anti-colonial feminist scholarship and activism including post-colonial transnational feminists, feminists and queers of color, and anti-colonial, decolonial feminists in the global south. In other words, the activism of these women's rights groups not only lacks a comprehensive and intersectional approach, but fails to address the relational nature of various forms of oppression and violence on a geopolitically uneven global stage. Recognizing that Palestine is indeed a feminist issue underscores the importance of addressing not only gender issues, but also broader social justice issues. Standing in solidarity with Palestinian feminists means actively opposing ethnic cleansing, the racism of extermination, and the everyday violence of settler colonialism in their lives, including systematic oppression, discrimination, and displacement of masses of Palestinians since 1948. Palestine is indeed a feminist issue, since as long as the genocide of Palestinians, women, children, and men is taking place in front of our eyes, there is no liberation for women. It's ridiculous, if not impossible, to be a feminist, to oppose violence, to care for women's lives and freedom, and to support genocide. Thank you. Thank you everyone for staying with us through these amazing presentations. We have gone from Sarah Imud's injunction to hold each other and tell the truth to Nadira reminding us what is going on ontologically in Ashla, also reminding us of Sama, reminding us of her instructing her cat to keep her whole. And then we got to Zeynep Korkman, myself, and Minu Mualam, as we all tried to track how apparently progressive discourses, anti-racism, anti-Semitism, how feminism itself has gotten co-opted uh, we have to reclaim feminism, is the message that the three of us pushed forward. We have to make sure that you cannot be in this apparently 
ridiculous position of supporting a genocide and calling yourself a feminist. So let's spend the remaining uh, few minutes of this webinar. We will attend to your questions as they come in, but also I would like to invite uh, everyone on the panel uh, if they have comments for each other, thoughts, or if they have critical updates on uh, what is going on since we recorded these a few days ago and every minute brings new destruction. So let me open it up to, uh, to you on the panel and uh, shortly to others in the chat. Well, I'm happy to begin. Thank you all again um, for these amazing presentations. I, I always learn so much from each of you and from, from each of your body of work. Um, I, I really want to uplift Nadra, Professor Shahub Kavorkian, um, who has just been such an amazing uh, inspiration as a feminist scholar in this moment. Um, and I think it's important to uplift and support um, all of the generations of our Palestinian feminist scholars and storytellers um, in all of the ways that we can, especially in a moment when they're actively, uh, when, when there are active attempts to silence um, our voices, um, and in this case, right, um, the attempt of the Hebrew University to, um, to punish and criminalize. Um, you're speaking out against genocide, um, which is a very feminist act. Um, and, you know, I just want to say that Nedra is one of my greatest teachers. And um, one of the first things that uh, she taught me as a young graduate student is that love is a method, right? Um, and part of practicing that method is listening deeply um, to our people, uh, to the voices and stories that are most marginalized and oppressed, even within our own hegemonic narratives, um, and to those narratives um, that are most often invisibilized, the stories of our women and children, but also the stories of our spaces, our homes, uh, the stories of our bodies. And I think she continues to model um, this method of love in listening deeply to even the story of the dismembered flesh of our martyrs um, in Gaza right now. Um, and I'll just mention that, you know, I was teaching uh, your, your last book last week in one of my classes, Nadra, on childhood, on, on unchilding, um, which has been a concept that has been so critical to us in our movement, but also to so many others across the globe. Um, and uh, the, the book really deeply affected my students. Um, and as a final assignment, I invited them to practice love as a feminist methodology um, by writing collective love letters to Palestinian children. Um, and I just wanted to share, if I have the time, uh, a piece of one of them now um, as an act of love for Nadra um, and, and as a, a, an illustration of how deeply her scholarship um, is valued. Uh, so let me just read a very small portion of this letter. Apologies. Of course, now I can't find the letter. I'll let someone else continue and I can come back to the letter when I find it on my screen. Sarah, do you want to say a little bit about in response to a comment from Barbara Barnes about uh, the concept of decolonial love? Yes, of course. Um, yes, uh, the concept of love. I mean, I think our movement has always been uh, a movement of love, of radical love and desire, radical love for our people um, and our homeland, uh, which is at its core about an affirmation of Palestinian life. And I think our ancestors and our feminist movement builders have taught us um, about this tradition of love as a method for our liberation for generations in the way that they have cared for and nurtured Palestinian life in all of the ways that they do and, and all the ways that we continue to see, you know, our women and, and other folks nurturing life on the ground in Gaza today, whether it's uh, making bread and food out of impossible conditions, whether it's caring for Palestinian life, um, children, um, you know, under conditions of mass starvation and unceasing bombardment and so forth. Um, but but our, our, our people have shown us, you know, for the last 100 years, 
um, how they practice uh, the affirmation of Palestinian life as a love practice against the violence of uh, colonialism and occupation. And so uh, a Palestinian feminist praxis of decolonial love invites us both to forcefully reject and interrupt uh, colonial narratives that justify these exterminatory policies of the Israeli state and its broader politics of death um, that is being waged not only on our people, but also on our land, on our waters, um, on our entire ecosystems of life as indigenous people. Um, but it also invites us to claim our role in this tradition, in this practice of affirming alternative futures for the Palestinian people and for all people. I think um, if we think with Palestine uh, today, not just as an object, but as uh, a paradigm for how we understand the state of the world today, um, with a reconsolidation of global powers that we're seeing and with the resistance efforts across the globe with people coming out in support of um, liberation and an end to this war, um, right? Uh, that, that we can see uh, our sort of intertwined projects of, of right, militarization, genocide in service of bringing alternative visions to the fore. Um, we need to uh, take on our own role in, in planting these seeds of, of new ways of being and relating to each other. Um, and so this is part of the urgent uh, invitation of embracing decolonial love as a method in this moment that we understand that um, we are each other's relatives implicated in each other's survival, that our struggles um, are intertwined, that, that Palestinian liberation is about so much more beyond Palestine, that it's about undoing the violent forms of power that are waging war on all of us collectively. And it means drawing on the strength and the courage of each other um, to collectively confront these predatory powers that seek to destroy our capacity to love um, and to share in each other's uh, com communal ways of being. Nader, I wonder if you, oh, there, there's a, a question for you, other ways of thinking about humanness. Yeah. I also want first to react to what Sarah um, uh, said, and thank you, Habibti. But I want to say something that if you remember when we were collecting letters from girls in Jerusalem, when we were conducting the study on access to justice, one way of trying to exercise feminism in a different way, uh, we needed to fight with international women organization, feminist organization, to consider letters of love as letters that speak about access to justice, about justice, and about the racism against the gendered body and the gendered self and so on. And it was a, a fight doing it. But unfortunately, I reached a place today with the genocide in Gaza from at that point when in 2014, 2015, when we were doing the study, uh, where I was trying to honor the letters, the writing, the, the voice of young girls to honoring body pieces. And this is where I'm trying to think how today our feminist reading, and unfortunately, Shireen, if I'm thinking your voice with, with what Mino was saying, it's feminism, yes, except for Palestine. Mm -hmm. When you come to Palestine, no, it doesn't work. And, you know, my, my, my colleague, Stephanie Wahab, uh, and for those, we wrote a piece exactly about this, that it's all of a sudden when you, when you reach Palestine and what you see in Palestine is from honoring the voices, honoring the talk, honoring the walk, the posting, the, 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 the innovation, the effective reactions to things, the pieces, people are refusing to leave a leg here and a hand here and a piece of flesh here to make sure that we are honoring our beloved ones. It's to come, and this is why I'm focusing on Ashla, and I know that it's heavy, but I could not go to any other play, place. I felt that it is digging in that flesh to bring back the oneness, the wholeness, mm -hmm. the empathy, and to, to, to look at the different points that were raised here, whether the geopolitical uh, modes of, of turning Palestinians into Ashla, whether it's what's going on in the settler colony, where from 48 
and cutting Palestinians of 48, 67 Gaza, Palestinians that are in the diaspora, Palestinians that are in refugee camps. And it's that the collective is still there. The wholeness is still there, even if it's in the Ashla, to the degree that we end up speaking to mm -hmm. cats because the world is not listening. And I think that this embracement, this feminist embracement, this feminist embracement of the pieces yeah is is uh, of the body of the dignity of the body of the honor is is where i want us to really think and yes nazan when you're asking about about uh, there is other way of thinking humanness what what you see what i see in the in the inability in the refusal of people that were wonderful in other feminist issues and no, if you'll ask me, Nadra, I will never agree to anybody abusing, sexually abusing, or or, mm. or disturbing women, Jewish or or Arabs, uh, black or white, uh, um, immigrants or non-immigrants. Of course, no, not in my name, not even if they're Hamas. No, I will never accept it. But all of a sudden, when it comes to Palestine, exactly as you were talking, saying, uh, Shireen, this refusal to see the humanness. So uh, the message to me is that you Palestinians are ontologically different. You're not even, you know, Denise de Silva talks about at the limits of the human. No, no, we're even more. We're not only non-being, we're below the non-being. Because when you look at a state agreeing to keep babies to decompose in incubators, how can I read it? But this, this decomposing of the wholeness of the Palestinian and what you see, what we hear from, from, from my perception is again, the collectiveness today in Ramadan, the, the, the togetherness, the wholeness, the power of the, and this is where I see the humanness of, of the Palestinian compass. And this is what pa, what Ashla is bringing. Ashla is saying, and you know, and I keep on thinking that what, that what are they telling me? Are they telling us that I'm, I'm trying to kill you for years, but you're not dying. You're evil. You're not dying. So we're cutting you into Ashla. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you mm -hmm. need to die only when you die and it, I will respect you, but even this is not working, even in death. So it's this overkillability that is defied and resisted by the power of love, of togetherness, of humanness. Yeah. And, you know, Bissan, one of the amazing Palestinians in, in Gaza, posted the other day, and I, I will read what she posted. She said, I want to die whole, a warm body capable of being hugged that's exactly that's exactly what i'm trying to say very powerfully said this question for zainab there i really appreciate the question i want to leave the panel i think that uh, Sorry, really powerful remarks. I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? A little bit. Okay. I wanted to say that even as I appreciate the question very much, I want to leave the panel with Sarah's and Nadira's very powerful remarks, which are still lingering, and then I want to uplift those. And thank you for the question. Minu, any parting words? So I think the uh, and the um, Sarah's suggestion of decolonial love is really interesting and also a wonderful pedagogic approach to the classroom. Uh, uh, but also what Nader uh, uh, talked about is so um, it's so it's breaking my heart really. And this is this shows actually that the genocide in Gaza is not only what is happening, but also it's putting up a show of extreme cruelty. 
on the global stage. And, and in my view, this is a turning point for feminist, feminist scholars and feminist activists since the genocide in Gaza is exposing the contradictions of the humanitarian project of liberal feminists and the whole industry of manufacturing consent through reference to women's issues and so-called women's question. I don't know how the coercive and militarized powers of Euro-American imperialism and the Israeli state can't function anymore without access to a flawed discourse of human rights or women's rights or a focus on the selective human rights of some versus the destruction of others on a global stage. This is also a, a special moment for a feminist, um, especially those in the global south and in marginalized location in the north to really reflect deeply and carefully on how to use this turning point to advocate for social and um, gender justice. There's no way of going back to the pre-genocide era, in my view. And, and so uh, the circulation of the discourse of liberation through occupation has lost its appeal, in my view. And the promise of um, a futurity based on women's freedom and liberation is seems to be dubious, you know, as it has been advocated by colonialist and imperialist feminists. But the danger of this situation is that this gap opens a vast space to be filled by misogynists, anti-feminists, and right-wing fascists. So however, still, I think the situation could potentially help anti-imperialist, anti-colonial feminists to imagine a different futurity, as uh, some of you actually argue. Uh, those are just my comments. Uh, uh, yeah, I too will uh, uh, will not uh, respond too much to, the, to that question. Uh, Israel does continue to push the narratives of mass rapes and it takes it to the UN and everyone gets exhausted looking for the evidence uh, and then trying to think of what to do when there's no evidence. So that is really uh, a game that is consistently being played. Uh, what what I would like to do to to end the, this webinar, I do want to to bring all our words together, and you know, as I said, hold each other and tell the truth is what Sarah Amud's uh, Mona tells us to 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 do, and this is what we will do. Uh, but I think Nadira, uh, Zainab, Minu, you have all. Um, presented to us, uh, I, Minu, I hear your words, there is no going back after this genocide. You know, even the, the, the famous Palestine exception in feminism, all of this is gone. All of this, the, the, the humanitarian human rights approach, we are all women, women's rights are human rights. We cannot speak like this as feminists anymore. This is, uh, this is it always has been wrong, but but now we know that this gets us nowhere except further down the road to genocide. And that as feminists, we are an, under an obligation to acknowledge what is going on, see what is going on, analyze what is going on, and, and never forget. And I think I want to end with something that Nadira said on a podcast recently with the MacDisi brothers. And she said, there's so much love in Palestine. And I want to leave us with that because I think it is a bit obscene that the rest of us have to hang on to Palestinians for dear life in this moment, since they are the ones who are losing their lives. But hang on, we must, because there is so much love in Palestine. And it is what we need now. Thank you all for being on this webinar. And for everyone listening, who, anyone who is still listening, it's been long, I know, you can get to this webinar and recordings from it, especially longer versions at uh, Gender Studies uh, YouTube channel. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.